My name is Bob Tinker. I am a multi-time entrepreneur. On the professional side, my key achievements, some were successes, some were failures, like a lot of entrepreneurs. Probably the one I'm most well-known for is being the founding CEO of a company called Mobile Iron, which we started in 2008 and grew from zero to $150 million of ARR over the course of five years and took it public on NASDAQ. Prior to that, I started a company, or as part of the founding team at a company called Airspace, which was also a success. We sold that to Cisco for 500 million in 2005. And prior to that, it was a company that did not do very well. And I learned a lot about what not to do. I grew up in the Midwestern part of the United States. My dad was an engineer and my mom was a scientist. So I think I just generally grew up being around technical people and I loved taking things apart when I was a kid. I used to take clocks apart, toys apart. You know, I was probably just destined to be an engineer <laughs> even as a small child. When I went to university, uh, I majored in computer science and industrial engineering. I uh, started my first job as an IT manager at a bank. My big transition to become an entrepreneur, however, happened when I moved to California in 1996. I came out here to go to business school and get an MBA at Stanford. I just fell in love with becoming an entrepreneur, the idea of starting your own business, the opportunity to make a difference in the world. You know, I also saw people make a lot of money doing it. As a 28-year-old coming out of grad school, that seemed like a great idea. The very first startup I worked for was one called Vertical Networks. It was an interesting idea. We built the very first IP PBX, which is basically a phone system that runs on the internet in 1998. Everybody knew that phone systems and voice and data were going to come together at the time, and it was definitely a problem that needed to be solved. The problem with Vertical Networks, though, is only big companies buy phone systems, really, and they only buy phone systems when they open up new offices. So even though it was going to be a big market over time, it was going to be very, 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 very slow. There was no urgency in the customer's mind. So the company always struggled as a result. There were some key things I learned along the way there. The first one was, if you're going to be a startup, solve a problem that has pain and urgency. The problem with my first company, Vertical Networks, was there was pain, but no urgency. Urgency answers the question, why is a customer going to buy now? and not six months from now. And when you're an early stage company with very little cash, you need customers to buy now. One of the great things about Silicon Valley and one of the great things about entrepreneurship is people respect failure because you get to learn what not to do. And as long as you walked away having learned important lessons that you put into practice to make a difference in the future, I think uh, failure is a great teacher. Hi, I'm uh, Tehi Nam. I'm co-founder of Storm Ventures. We're a venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley focused on B2B software companies. I have invested in over 200, of which 12 have become unicorns. I have also was a founding CEO of Airspace that we sold to Cisco for about half a billion. So when Airspace first got started, uh, I was just an investor, in, but I was the only investor. And the company was uh, incubated at Storm office. So the original idea for Airspace uh, came from uh, someone that was working at Storm, Tim Danforth. He was a technologist out of Cisco, has a lot of experience. He came up with the idea of having one infrastructure to support both cellular and Wi-Fi access. I like the idea of Wi-Fi and cellular because then you can support all wireless in one box. I thought that people will want to have have uh, simple and easy wireless access. And so I figured Wi-Fi would be the way because Wi-Fi leverages open spectrum, so it's free. It's not like cellular where you have to pay a cellular provider. So that was my belief in why we started uh, Airspace. And to be honest, the beginning of Airspace was really hard. I actually hired four people to do cellular, four people to do Wi-Fi. But then uh, uh, as we talked to customers, we realized that customers Customers just wanted Wi-Fi only. That's why we pivoted to Wi-Fi only and I had to actually lay off half the team at that point. I remember one of the people I laid off moved him from outside the United States to Silicon Valley to do this company and then I had to lay him off. It was tough to lay off 50%. Well, the alternative is we shut the whole company down and I lay off 100%. <laughs>
And this also was in 2002 when Silicon Valley was going through a very difficult time. At that moment, uh, uh, given the difficulty of Silicon Valley, the problems that airspace had in the beginning because we were pursuing the wrong product strategy, the natural temptation would be to shut it down. And the only way I could persuade my partners that we should continue funding is for me to become the CEO of the company. But that also increased my accountability and that meant if the company failed, I'd be fired. And one thing that boosted my confidence that we should continue is uh, I was talking to Samsung executives and they were saying how they want to uh, Wi-Fi enable all their like laptops and consumer devices. And that gave me confidence that maybe this is the beginning of a way. And then once I believed in the Wi-Fi only, then we needed to hire out the rest of the engineering team, the go-to-market people, and ultimately my replacement, who was uh, employee number 24. And uh, as I was talking to one of the investors now about the go-to-market, I mentioned we want to pursue one based on partnerships. And that's when uh, my co-investor introduced Bob and saying Bob would be very good at partnerships. The idea behind Airspace was to enable people to use Wi-Fi at work. We probably all laugh about now, oh my God, there was a time when we did not use Wi-Fi at work, but this was 2002. Intel had just put Wi-Fi built into their very first laptop. And people were like, how do I use this? What can I attach it to? And all of a sudden now people were bringing to work saying, how do I attach this to a network? And they were putting Linksys access points under their desks and creating holes into the network and creating huge security issues. Airspace's mission was to bring Wi-Fi to the enterprise. That worked out pretty well. We timed that right. There was a wave of change with laptops now enabled with Wi-Fi. There was a big pain because enterprises were like, uh-oh, now what do we do? And we built a solution for that. At Airspace, we tackled a problem that had both pain and urgency. We went from zero to $80 million over the course of about three years. How do you get your first 10 customers? Every startup really wrestles with that because it's hard. You know, if you think about it from the point of view of your customers, imagine you're a person going into a hospital and you need surgery and the doctor says, you're going to be my very first patient. You'd be like, I don't, I don't want you to operate on me. I don't want you as my doctor. Your challenge as an early startup is you have to convince customers to buy your product when nobody else has. Like, how do you do that? Sometimes it comes from previous relationships where you've been able to work at other companies and had customer relationships where they trust you. That can help, but the real thing you need to do is make sure you're solving a pain that has urgency because when people have a pain that's urgent, they're willing to take risks on buying from a smaller company. The second thing that's important in terms of finding and winning your early customers is listen to them. One of the things we did that worked really well is we had this concept called a teaching customer. When you're out talking to early prospects, some say yes, some say no, some say maybe, and you get a lot of feedback. It's hard to figure out like, who do you listen to? Figuring out which customers are the ones you really wanna to listen to and index on their feedback because you believe there are other customers out there like them, we called those teaching customers. What we found was if we picked the right teaching customers and indexed on their feedback, that allowed us to get from one customer to three customers to five customers to 10. It's a rough road though. Your first couple deployments are usually really bumpy. Your product doesn't work really well. It's brand new. There are things that go wrong. It's hard but that's part of the fun. If you do a good job, you become friends with them because you solved a problem for them that helped them become a hero. They become vested in the success of your company and care about it. It's really, really hard to win early customers, but if you get a couple great early customers, they'll say good things to other customers and start the flywheel of credibility that allows you to find a product market fit. The thing we did a really good job of at Airspace was finding channel partners that would help airspace sell to large enterprise customers. Because one of the challenges that as a small startup you have, selling to big, large established companies is they look at you and be like, you're a little company, why should I buy from you? So by having big friends who work with you to help sell your product, it enabled us to win a lot of very large customers, which really helped accelerate our growth. Uh, we grew very quickly in 2005. We were $80 million, the business is cranking. We had unified effectively all the companies that hated Cisco against Cisco. Uh, we called it the ABC strategy, anybody but Cisco strategy, and it worked. Then what happened to Cisco came knocking and said, we'd like to buy you. You know, my feelings were mixed. 
actually. Because on one hand, we were super excited to be building airspace. We felt like we had a path to really grow the business in front of us. So on that hand, I was like, oh, I don't really want to sell to Cisco. But then the other side of it was, it was a huge compliment that Cisco reached out and said, look, we believe you're a great business, great product, great team. We'd like to have you part of our, our company. It was kind of confusing actually, because I had these two very different reactions to it. But at the end of the day, we felt that the combination of sort of number one, the opportunity to merge with the market leader and to be able to sell airspace products through the entire Cisco sales channel was just like, wow, we can make a huge difference. So many people will get to use airspace product. That was really compelling. The second thing that was really compelling was frankly, you know, they offered a good price for the company. And we looked at that and said, that's probably the right thing to do for our investors. So we decided to do it. You know, it was still hard though, because when you sort of give up on running your own independent company and become part of a larger company, it is the end of an era. So it's bittersweet because you have to say goodbye to airspace, move out of your office, the logo goes away, all the things you worked on so hard go away. Well, that was a controversial decision and it was tough. In hindsight, you know, people could say we made the wrong decision. Um, we were uh, ahead of companies like Aruba and Ruckus, much bigger at the time, and they became multi-billion dollar companies, unicorns. One of the things I'm most proud of is that it was either two or three years later, Cisco sold almost a billion dollars of airspace equipment into customers. I would say it impacted me, one, in a good way and a bad way. In the bad way, it made me believe that I could uh, fix companies because I could run the company, I know what to do, so I felt like I could fix companies. And so I made some poor investments where I believed that I could coach the founder or the CEO and make the company successful. That was a, a, a bad lesson I learned from airspace that I had to change how I invested. In terms of uh, good, I mean, it gave me the confidence and a formula on how to make good future investments, which is identify a wave and be able to catch the wave and surf the wave. So this is sort of an embarrassing story. After product market fit, there's a missing link that didn't even really have a name. The advice that investors gave us and that other startups said, well, just go hire some salespeople. Turned out, that's not actually what happens. I was super frustrated by that. Heroic selling doesn't work. You need a, a simple, repeatable process that you can hire ordinary people, not founders, not clone founders. That's what we said is that product market fit is not enough. You need uh, this repeatable, scalable process that we called uh, uh, go-to-market fit.